right off the bat, we've got to get in the in the dark, oh, wow. deep. We're we're going through a <laughs> we're going. It's like a dungeon the, crawl of a book. Um, the mouth of hell. The <laughs> hell mouth by Giles Christian. You know the best way I could describe this book because uh, I've described it to a few people that I've because I I encouraged a few people to read it that I thought might like it, and I said. Right. It's like if Diablo came with like a novella companion, you know, it's like it, it feels like Diablo the game, but set in this historical fiction setting right. um, and way more graphic than they could ever be <laughs> with the game. Um, yes, this was quite the graphic uh, novel. <laughs> yeah, it's like I think Say. this was my first real forte into like real grim, dark fantasy. You know, it's um because obviously Brandon Sanderson's not grim dark, and I, I wouldn't call Stephen King's stuff grim dark fantasy, even though he can be, you know, he right. can be blunt. You know, I would say um, this is uh kind of the first of that genre right. that I think that I've read, and I liked it. I liked it a lot. I th- I want to read more of this type of fantasy. So it is historical fiction, and it looks like I've never read anything by this author, but it looks like all of his books are right. are set that way um and that was you know i really enjoyed how at the end of the audiobook they had a whole extra chapter where he just described the history he described of, the history of that place yeah like that was a real place yeah that was really that was really neat but so the uh the description on amazon um bohemia 1370 i'll try to do the <laughs> I'm gonna try to do the same voice from the book <laughs> A lost soul named Galian leads a band of of hardened mercenaries on a mission for Mother Church. But in the dark forest of Central Europe, a darker secret awaits. Best-selling author Giles Christian Lancelot, the Raven Viking Trilogy, takes us on an unnerving ride into fear and paranoia, bloodshed, and redemption. Um, so that's a pretty short description for a pretty short story. Um, that right. is pretty straightforward. It's, uh, we follow this character as he is basically given like a new mission for the church. I really liked how it was like the church that was kind of like, you know, reaching out to him to do this, to do this. And he's, an, he's a heretic right. as well. Yeah, he, like he's been excommunicated from the church for whatever. For whatever, yeah. I don't think we, I don't think we ever found that out. No, I mean it has something. You, you know, you find out something about his wife and child, yeah. but you don't know what happened either because mm-hmm. he never explains it. But apparently, whatever it was, I'm assuming you know he have to assume they're dead, mm-hmm. um, and that the church probably had. In some way, shape, or form, had something. I'm not saying they were directly responsible. But somehow, he blames them. Yeah, probably that was the impression I got. Like, yeah, like you know, like you know, damn you, God, or something like that. And they're like, yeah, you know, you're out of here, guy, kind of thing. But yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you know, I also feel like he's seeking redemption for something because you know what they offer him is that basically we'll we'll grant you forgiveness and we'll let you back into right. the church and then also at the end of the story um which whenever he's confronted with you know what is essentially satan at the end of the story um you know he tells him like you can't give me what i want and i think i think that's what he's talking about it's like he right. couldn't he can't receive that like that forgiveness or that redemption from, from, from Satan himself, you know? Um, so that's, uh, for it to be such a short story, he's a, com- he's a compelling character. I really like oh, Galen a lot. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I would say he's the only character we really dive into because it's his internal monologue and it's such a short story. There's like nowhere else really for it to go right. into these other characters, but I found him compar- compelling enough that if they did a prequel to this, I would read it. Right. Like I would be interested if there was more of of this character by this writer. I would I would be interested to to hear more. Yeah, I would, I would definitely check him out. And um, because you know, I, there's obviously been like a a time frame between when whatever yeah. happens happens, and then he's like now in this. You know, it starts out where he's in this battle, and you know now has like a like the band of mercenaries yeah the you know basically the church is just like hey not only will they give him or or they're offering him they're gonna offer everyone else like their freedom and um so you know it sounds like 
he's not alone. I mean, obviously, as far as he's with this group, but he's not the only one. It sounds like they've all have been excommunicated or uh, of some form from the church as well. Uh, and, uh, you know, did they all meet up by chance or did they all do something together, you know, way yeah. back when or whatever? But go ahead. They're like a band of 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 miscreants, you know, like they're yeah. and it's it's a very it's it's almost like a balanced party sort of thing. You know, like you've got like a rogue type character. There's like the big brute guy. And and so while while the book never really, you know, I, I just looked the. Amazon says the print version of the book is 48 pages long. So it's, it's not even 50 pages long. So right. while there's no deep diving into like what those characters might be thinking in these moments, um, they, they're still like kind of a colorful bunch and they give you a good idea of like, right. you know, what types of escapades the, this group may have gotten into in the past. You can, you can kind of imagine that. And you've got uh, like the, the badass women warriors you've got like you know the smart ella guy you got like the young kid that's you know yeah still wet behind the ears kind of thing so he hits all the gamuts definitely right right yeah uh, and you know just gives you enough to give you some interest in you know the various characters so um yeah i think you know for the amount of pages he used i mean he he did well as setting up other, other than just galleon if um, if if I were to give a complaint about the book and you tell me if you felt the same way, I felt like it took a while to sort of set things up. So like the book jumps right in with the action and then they have a necessary, you know, plot line where they, they run into the church and they get propositioned in what they want to do. But then kind of once the adventure starts, there's a lot of time of them just walking through a quiet village and then you know it's it really right. it really kind of jumps into like the the hellmouth action, you know. Once they find the castle um, outside the village in, in the woods outside the village, and for it to be such a short story, I felt like a, a pretty fifty percent of it was was setting up that. Um, right. But it, it it still was great imagery, and I thought it was tense. It just it just for me it was a little bit long just in that part. But then yeah, once. Yeah. Once the ball started rolling and, you know, they're they're they can't be confident in what they're seeing and you can tell that their senses are being toyed with and like all of that right. was was really good. It's just if you were to look at the fraction of the book, I feel like that was kind of a, you know, well, once they found the, the whole the, uh, the well, once they found the other knights that were hanging mm -hmm. um, up outside of the town and that. Um, oh, yeah. Know, that kind of yeah. imagery was really cool. Like. Yeah, uh, I I enjoyed all the imagery uh, like all the way through the book. It's it's really, you know, the 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 term that comes to my mind right away is wicked. It's like really wicked imagery. Um, <laughs> right. I, but I love that. I thought it was I thought it was so so cool. I liked it a lot. <laughs> yeah, and um, you know, they uh, he he was able to paint a good picture with like the you know like when you go into like the village when they first you know they're like you know we're gonna we're just gonna keep going and. You know, they go and they're looking around and there's no one there, but then they find like that pig pen with like yeah. the the couple pigs eating the other pig, you yeah. know, survive and like you're just like it, it was really good mentally, like you know, you could see that little small Scandinavian village like, you know, abandoned and stuff like that. And then um even like the the historical accuracy and the the just the what the castle was like you mm -hmm. know they where they said like in real life and in the story the in the battlements the the slots for the arrows were painted they weren't real right yeah but inside the castle pointing inside the arrow slots were real and they were like so it's like uh -huh. they were trying to keep something in yeah. yeah instead of trying to defend something from without and you know that's kind of and yeah, you know, like, that was true. They were like, "That's really part of that castle." Plus, it is out in the middle of nowhere, right? And it doesn't really make much sense for it to be there and all this stuff. And no strategic said, value for it to no be there. No strategic value. They said the Germans. You know, they said that thing. The Germans used it. I think. Um, I can't remember. There was legend World, that yeah, World War two or something. And um, yeah, you know, I guess they're saying on to the occult and stuff. Trying to yeah, because you know, apparently. I know as far as the Nazis, I don't know about during World War 
one, but apparently the Nazis were on to the occult and stuff. So who knows? They could have been trying to get into the Hellmouth. Yeah, there's a whole lot of like folklore around that actual right. location that this book is uh, is is based on. Um, yeah, it, the the imagery. I think I don't know. There's a few there's a few moments in the book that I, I can't really compete for which one is my favorite. You know, imagery, but there's a few that as a dungeon master, there's a few that like. I'm going to, I'm going to store <laughs> and, and reuse this whole, this whole, this whole book felt like a session I would love to run. Um, right. That, I thought the same thing when we were doing it, but that would be a cool like, little session. To, yeah. Like, get in this castle, find the well and all that. Yeah. Whatever they, whenever they had the, they found the well and all the men were gathered around it, um, huddled together. Um, naked. Chanting. Naked. And then there's like a, a corpse across from them on a throne with the with the goat like head. Um right. and then they shoot an arrow into it and it basically just thunk into a into a corpse, but then the all the people look up. That was a great moment. Like that yeah. that was one of the moments that built the whole the whole story for me. Um I agree. A, a, another really good moment. Um oh, and then the fact that they used the rope from the room before where all the women were hanging upside <laughs> right. down. Yes. Again, just a brilliant tool that you could use like, in a D and D game where it's like, you know, well, it's, it's funny. <laughs> like that seems like the, the, the woman, one of the women runs off mm -hmm. and they're just, just like oh, the character you know, group. Yeah. yeah, The character group. And he's just like, you know, she runs off and then like later she's like back and she's got all those ropes. Oh, she you, falls like, into the well. She, well, I'm talking about the yeah, this you know, there's two women. Oh, okay. I know so someone else one, one fell in and then the other one runs to get the ropes and then it comes back and but you know, and like you just remember you're uh, like okay. Like, oh yeah, like those are all where all those corpses were hanging. That's right. those ropes. That's where she's been. Yeah. And uh yeah, the the only so my only knock as far as I got lost in a couple of places and I had to like re-listen or, you know, a couple of things. There was a few things like in the well itself. So first, you know, the girl flips over, then they get the ropes and they're going to climb down. Well, my first thought was, why didn't you just drop a torch down the well? Cause, and then he, he made the, it be known that like, it wasn't just dark. It was like, dark like you couldn't like it wasn't it was almost he didn't say magic but it was almost like a magic dark mm -hmm. and uh they couldn't see it all and i was like well did they not drop a torch down the well they they never they never dropped a torch they went and got torches and he climbed down remember he was and then he got to the end and he's like i think i see a ledge and then he swings and he lands on this ledge and that's kind of the, the ledge thing is where i've been getting confused because like somehow i don't know where this ledge was because like the next thing you know they're all down at the bottom i don't when think to skip over like what yeah. happened right there and i was like what the i was like so, i don't know i think this kind of goes so i've got two points on this one is i think this kind of goes back to the point i was i was trying to make earlier was that they spend so much time explaining them walking through the village and getting to the castle. But then once they go through the well, it's just, they, they, they like, you it know, skips a lot like, in a, in a single like, sentence. Like, he hand waves over <laughs> large portions of like them yeah. going through corridors and ducking under things and all this, like, and I, I think I would have been interested in to fleshing that out more, you know? Well, that's what I was thinking too. Cause I was like, I'm so lost. Like he was just, they were all up above him. Yeah. And he was speaking to a ledge, and then literally the next sentence, they're all at the bottom, like yeah. in this dark corridor. And I'm like, what but the hell? Like my second, but the, my second point to that though is the the way I took all those moments where they're like they 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 find an underground lake, and then there's a rowboat, you know, at the edge of the lake. Conveniently, they all get on the boat. After they're right. they're going through for a while, they begin to forget like why they're there, and he forgets the face of one of the guys walks off the boat. He forgets the face of that guy, and it's as if fifty years have passed. Right, um, and you know, I'm thinking back on it now after I've heard him talk about the historical story. But he also mentions how like it seemed like people went down and their hair turned white, and it was like they white, yeah. they aged and stuff like that. And so I'm thinking 
And then they're like, oh, and then the ceiling turns into clouds and then they end up on like the shore of some beach. And then that leads to like a forest. And, and so I think that like, as a reader, we're skipping through all these parts because of the way it's written. But I also think that it's also an illustration of how the characters are kind of like gliding through these moments and they don't really understand what's happening either. You know, like it's, right. I think it's, it's disorienting both in the way it's written and in the character's perspective. It's, it's, it's disorienting. Um, but I, I really enjoyed, I really en- like once we got, once they did that, once we had the moment where they're, they're like on an ocean, like a dark ocean and there's these black clouds above them and then they end up on the shore Right from then, from that moment on, it's you're just riding the ride to the. Well, you know, and like you know, something's up when they they find the girl that fell over and she's like yeah. cooking food and all this stuff. Yeah, and like no one's like really questioning like how did you get here? Like what's yeah. going on? They're all just like, ah, oh, like yeah, there she is, you know. And, like, oh, we got an even bigger party over here we're going to go to. And the second part of the imagery thing that was really crazy was this part. Yeah. Because when they go to this party and it's like this giant feast and they're like women and sex everywhere. And like he he really wants to fall into this thing and like, you know, the, everyone else around him he's looking is like, you know, eating and having sex at the same time and like yeah and the whole time also you've got this nun woman oh yeah we haven't even talked about the nun yeah um that are they're with them and um you know like i want to point out to about the nun leading up to this moment as gillian is like going deeper and deeper into these caverns and corridors she gets closer and closer to and him, closer and closer and, to him, and he keeps like feeling her and like talking to him in his mind, and he in knows it's her. Yeah. And by the time they get to like this point in the story, she's like in his shadow, like she's like right behind him. And I just I thought that was interesting. And there's even a, I was even thinking, like, what if we're seeing this story? Probably wrong about this because of the way we we find out at the end that he actually is tied to her story in some way. But I was, but it, when I was actually listening to this, um, I was thinking, what if we're we're following Gillian's uh, story? But what if the other characters are having a similar thing, where they also feel connected to to this nun, and their perception is that she's getting closer and closer to them, and in their shadow, like they're each kind of experiencing this, you know, right, the same thing. But after hearing the ending, I I, I think it probably right. was just him because he he is connected to her story. Um, but yeah, the feast scene, uh, the feast orgy scene, which what better way to have an orgy than uh, to also orgy. have a for a feast. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> um, that, that was really cool because it didn't feel like it was, it was, it was, it didn't feel gratuitous. Like if it felt like it really served the mood and the imagery of this story, like, right. like they are completely entranced and they, are like succumb to this like just debauchery debauchery like, yeah that's that's yeah, I mean, like, the only word for it and um and then the the priest is actually the first person that kind of has like a moment of clarity where he's like like at Gillian. the same time he's got like five women draped <laughs> all over him <laughs> yeah um and then it turns out they're really they're really eating him and uh the there's the man that's like eating his own arm and yeah it's right. all yeah that, that was cool like I was yeah like, hey, that was a yeah. really cool that was a really cool scene i actually listened to this entire book and then uh it's such a short it's just such a short short story that like i was i was telling becca about it as we were driving back from greenville one day and i just said let's just listen to it again it was <laughs> <laughs> listen to it all again <laughs> um i mean it's so it's so wild um and then i really liked after this scene the 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 like the like demon creatures are like like climbing in the shadows and along the walls and and right. like pulling pulling characters into the shadows and devouring them and but all of that happens so fast like basically yeah, right. that that is just like a very brief like quick description of that before they lead into um uh Gillian 
and the uh the nun lady i can't remember her name but they they like, face the off to the the, the the demon that says bring me the girl <laughs> yeah, yeah. so <laughs> i never knew i had a thing for for voice acting but i could do that voice so uh cool. any any other diablo demon esque dark uh fantasy stories you're the man. the man i could do the demon <laughs> voice <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing so like what what we find out is that um you know like she had been sacrificed yeah a long time ago with her and her mom as witches to yeah. the whale um now here's the thing was she and her mom and yeah. her witches because from what i gathered they were <laughs> right <laughs> It's the it's the hocus pocus conundrum where it's exactly. and I was like you, at first you're like oh they sacrifice you know it's a witch trial thing you know yeah. all the hoopla and they sacrifice his yeah. innocent mom this... and daughter and then you listen to it and you're like no I'm pretty sure she's all all into this she's right. like right. she's ready to go back to right. this this demon like this wasn't like a she was pulled away from him she was kidnapped <laughs> essentially like. And um yeah, I know she wants to go home to her demon daddy, like maybe like, the mother was a witch, but she wasn't, you know, and I, and, I and now she is because of the sacrifice. Now she's uh that was that was a very like I was like listening to it, I was like, Wow, I didn't okay. Hey, <laughs> good one. <laughs> I do I do love that, like because I've always said that about hocus pocus. Like the moral of the story should be that we that we did something wrong in our past and that like we learned from it. I, I, I say we, I'm Irish. I wasn't part of those settlers, but like we, <laughs> but like we, it should be that like, we, like we did something wrong and we learned from it. Like we were, but in, in both Hocus Pocus and this story, we were probably right. They were witches. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <That's> what... <laughs> it kind of and... messes up the, the moral of the story. <laughs> right. Well, like, what is it like he takes her there and then like she opens up like her wings or something like that and you're, you're just like yeah oh, yeah yeah me. yeah like, did but, not see the wing thing coming <laughs> but was she a demon but was she a demon all right when she was a kid right did she become a demon because she got sacrificed and then she like became the pet of this uh, demon that lives underneath this hell mouth and so now yes she is but maybe she wasn't whenever gillian pushed her in the well you know but but maybe the mother was. <laughs> I, don't, mother I don't know. Daughter. I don't know. Um, I like the I like the way that the the uh, church characters are written, where you know in this in this time period, like the church was basically like the bureaucratic government, like yeah, uh, and, and highly corrupt and highly corrupt. Yeah, <laughs> and uh, and I I I, I enjoy that aspect of the story. Um, yeah but yeah and, and the fact that the um you know the uh the weird body thing that they that was outside the cave or the the whale thing was a bishop oh yeah that yeah was, that's right you know supposed to be there to like yeah i forgot protect, about that he's you know, and, and isn't and that who they originally like, that's originally who they said they were looking for right right yes yeah yeah okay but they didn't say like they kind of lied about who he actually was. Right. Yeah. And, and like, that's the other thing. Like I couldn't decide if he, I think just from exposure, I guess he eventually turned would be my guess. Right. Like just being close to the well for however long he was there eventually got to him. Um, I don't think he was like a, an evil guy that, you know, was was part yeah. of the church or something i think they you know in reality put him there to like hey you're you know you're the line of the last line of defense like there's weird stuff happening in this town go see if you can be um you know a guiding light and to these people. they sent knights too yeah because um, they found oh, all yeah. the yeah. out there too so i mean they probably i hadn't considered yeah. all of that but that's yeah. but that's part of the neat thing about this book is that there's so much right you can make your own conclusions right so yeah things, there's like, yeah i'm telling you this would be a great that he should convert this to some kind of campaign so what was weird um going back just a little bit to mm -hmm. another weird thing was so when when galen 
wakes up and realizes that you know this feast is you know a smoke screen and everybody's doing weird things um that part too like it jumped around a lot and i got confused because like the way at first i thought it was was that all of his crew his mercenaries were all like taken and he was the only one and then the one person also was, was waking up and then they immediately got healed and so i'm like okay like He's 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 alone or whatever, and then like a couple minutes later, like there's a whole, several like, of them left. Yeah, and I was like, okay, what happened here? And that's a, in, when those creatures started coming in. That's where like it jumbled up a little bit, and maybe yeah, that, he just tried to get through it a little bit. And that's where like the one guy, his best friend guy, I can't remember his name. Was, yeah, he was back up on that ledge again. I was like, how the hell did he get back up on this ledge? Where? So the one thing I did kind of take from this, and I, I, I'm assuming it's probably true, is that when they went down that well, they got to the bottom, and they never left that little area. They think they walked to some lake, and they went across this lake, and then they went to this feast. But I think all of that was in their minds. I think they got to the bottom of this pit, and they started having some sort of delusion from that point on, because they were... Once the feast thing oh, okay. ended, they were they were back to where they started. Like they never went back across the lake. They never did any of that stuff. They were literally back to where they started. So I'm assuming that, and that's kind of my thing from earlier was like, you know, how they do this, this. I think it was like that because it was kind of like a dream. So you have like little snippets, like hmm. they're here, and then the next thing you know, they're here and they don't know that time is going by. You, you know what I'm saying? Like, I, yeah. think, I think they were all just probably just standing there like zombies at the bottom of this pit, yeah. staring off into space as they're, you know, slowly getting surrounded by these demons eventually once they wake up and stuff. And then, I don't know. I, I mean, that's just... Well, that plays into... Yeah, I don't think you're right or wrong. And I think that it's... So I my the way I view the this whole portion is that it's inconsequential whether they're physically moving through corridors or what either way their perception of what's happening like this is not a physical place where they're actually able to walk through these various right. corridors and stuff like this is just this is just like how hell works you know what i mean like he like you're just right their, their experience of it and even the passage of time where where they describe 50 years past it feels like 50 years has passed since he saw that one dude's last face or that that <laughs> since the last time he saw that guy's face um right. i think even that is just like the way the human brain is like not able to conceive of like what they're what they're actually what going they're, through right, right now yeah um but i know that you know we discussed um off the air we kind of have talked about the ending of the book together and um that that idea that they never actually left the well kind of gives some makes that's why you believe that he's choking at the end whenever whenever he's drowning but yeah so he um you know he he after all the the stuff is then it is just him and the nun he takes her to this other room where this voice is you know bring her to me bring me the girl and um so he does and then you know it turns out that you know it was it was more of a like we said, a return home more instead of a, I'm turning over this innocent girl to this demon. Essentially, he wants, I guess he wants Galen to join him is kind of, I guess, what I was getting out of it at the end. You know, he's like, you know, I don't know if he wants him to lead some sort of demon army. Again. I don't know what. But yeah, like, he's definitely yeah. wanting fealty. Like, he's definitely wanting him to to bend the knee, you know. To bend the knee to him, yeah. In Re some, whatever that means. And, and then, like, Alien has, like, the epiphany, like, you know, I'm, you know, I'm not going to do this and blah, blah, blah. And then that's when the ending, he is, like, being pushed down. And it's it's and, essentially and the it's, opening of the book, yeah. And then it's, back, it's like he wakes up and he's being, you know, trying to be drowned and he wakes up in the, the stream again. And so it's basically like Groundhog Day. He's yeah. being killed and then waking up in the same day so, or whatever and, and reliving it that, so, that's my gist of it yes that, that, that day. that's kind of what i was thinking too or, or time frame however long the time frame is so i'm of 
I'm of two minds of it. That's one is that, that he, that Galen is in hell and this is his torture having to relive this over and over again. That was, that was my initial reaction. And that, and that could very well be the intention of the author. Um, but then I also thought that it could just be that, you know, this demon thing that is so much more powerful than anything that Galen could ever conceive of, like really does just is on him and killing him so fast that his next moments are, you know, him suffocating. And it just is like poetic justice. Like it is just, it happens to be that he's dying in the same way that the opening of the book, you know, described. Right. And it's not necessarily connected in this loop. Kind of like how in Lost, Jack ends at the, uh, you know, the ending scene of the of Lost is similar to the first scene of Lost, but it's, right. but it's just a poetic thing. It's, it's, it's not that this, the island is in loop, oh, but we could do a whole nother podcast all about that. <laughs> um, but the, but I do think that, I do think that it is some sort of groundhog day. Like this is Galien's hell because um, when I went back and listened to the book for a second time, I listened to even the first lines of the book kind of play on that theory because he says that like, uh, he's being, you know, held under and it's like, he's trying to like pull a demon out from hell or, or trying to like, he, he mentioned something like right. that, like pulling a soul into hell, like pulling, like keeping a demon out or something like that. And so it also kind of does play into that theory that like, you know, he is, he is in, in hell somehow, or he is like, I don't know. I think it, I think it, I think that's probably the most likely, yeah. most likely theory of the intention. My other idea was that it was a, like a brief flash of like a yeah. precognizant thing. I thought that, of that too. Yeah. Um, that that's what was going to happen. And, you know, it, it could still be a, a groundhog ish, but like, it's more of like, Hey, if this is what you do, this is what's going to happen. So then you have the opportunity to change something. Oh, uh, okay. Oh. Um, you know, now he he goes forward with the knowledge of what's going to happen, sort of thing. But I, I'm way, way, way more leaning toward the whole. You know, he's reliving this over and over again. Because uh, you know, even throughout the story, she he thinks he's met her, the nun before, or like mm. there's different things where, like you know, kind of like the Matrix thing with deja vu and like with reliving the same thing over and over again, you're, you're subconsciously picking up on, you know, yeah. different things. And and I think that's what's happening. Like he is remembering different. He, he thinks he's remembering things. He knows, you know, something is weird, um, you know, with the voices and her and like, um, there's, there's other little things where he has like these moments where he's kind of like questioning things. And I think that all comes from, it's because he's done it. Um, yeah. And, you know, he's, like I said, maybe just subconsciously it's affecting him. Um, you know, obviously not like an actual Groundhog Day where he remembers everything. But, yeah. Um, but no, I thought that was a very cool concept. Um, and again, it's another one of those things that allows you to make oh, your yeah. own conclusion just like about everything it. Else, so yeah. like, um, it's very you know, fitting. Yeah. I really like this author. This is all, this is yeah. the only 48 pages I've ever, um, you know, listened to, or this is the only thing I've ever consumed by this author. And, um, I, I'm not really into like the Camelot lore stuff. I mean, like, you know, have an awareness of it. Right. But I'm not, I'm not super into, uh, into that more than I am like non-historical fiction stuff, which I know that that stuff's not necessarily historical, but you know what I mean? Um, right. I like more uh, Lord of the Rings style fantasy than <laughs> than that style of fantasy. Um, and um, but I really like this author enough, and I like the way this book was written, like the way the way the prose were written. Like I I, I really like the descriptions right. where some parts were like really simple, and then some parts were you know more fleshed out and and poetic. And um, I I would really like to find something else to read by Giles Christian. Yeah. Um, so that's definitely a name that we should look at again in the future. I think that I need to do a little bit of research to find out like what his, uh, what is popular or like what he's famous for. Yeah. It, it looks like it is a lot of historical, a lot of historical yeah. fiction stuff. Um, which I don't think I would normally be into, but like I said, I liked this a lot, so you should give it a try. Yeah, yeah. What I liked about this was that like, it was like historical 
uh, fiction, but it was still like magic fantasy. Like, you know what I mean? Like it obviously right. historically you can't, you can't say that it, it's written anywhere that there's like a hole that leads to hell and that's Satan. <laughs> like, you know what I mean? Like, right. like, obviously this stuff is fantasy. Um, but the, the fact that it's grounded in this, like, like real, um, cool, uh, lore is, uh, is, is pretty neat. I'm kind of looking at his website. He's got, yeah, like you say, he's got the Camelot and Lancelot thing, but he's got yeah. like, looks like nothing is really, um, there's a couple series, but there's several standalone books he has. Um, yeah, we'll have to find something, we'll have to find yeah. something else. If it, you know, if in, you know, once this is posted to the YouTube, if you're like a Giles Christian reader and you have a suggestion for the next book, we should like, right. consider it. All right. Well, I think we can move on from hell mouth. Girl. Um, we brought the girl. Yeah. We don't really have a rating system, but I'll just say I like this. I liked it a lot. It was good. I'd give it four stars. Should we come up with a rating? Should we come up with a rating system? Like an out of five or out of 10? What do you think? Out of five? or See, The reason why I hesitate to do a rating system is because I know that you'll we'll rate something high, but then we'll compare right. it to something else we rated and we'll be like, oh, but right. you know what I mean? Like both of those are exactly. really good. I don't really know that I could compare the two. <laughs> we need, uh, I give this, I give this five out of six bottomless Magic. pits. <laughs> bottomless pits to hell. <laughs> hell mouth openings. 